share our thoughts and ideas with others, a tool that we use to discover the world around us. Reading specialists, our goal is to educate and empower students to become confident lifelong learners. We aim to deliver the highest quality of instruction through experienced and qualified educators. Literacy is a fundamental right that transcends all barriers. And we believe that in order for us to achieve this, we need to build strong, healthy partnerships with the community. How do we help children reach their full potential? We do it through art, assessment, remediation and intervention, and training. Reading specialists started in January 2004. During the time, we were still renting a place half of what we currently occupy. I started reading specialists because at that time there were only very few reading centers offering reading intervention. I was ready to share the best practices I learned. The reading specialists, empowering through literacy since 2004. Okay, um, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us um, for today's webinar. My name is Lyra Pandy, and I'm the center head of the Reading Specialists. So for those of you who don't know who we are, the Reading Specialists is a center located in Alabang, Muntinupa, and we are currently providing online literacy intervention and um, intervention services, as well as webinar trainings for parents and educators. Today, we are presenting the sixth part of the Reading Matters series, Optimizing Reading in Remote Learning. This webinar is presented in partnership with the Reading Association of the Philippines, Homeschoolers of the Philippines, Council of Reading Intervention Specialists, the Homeschool Association of the Philippine Islands, Homeschool Global, Saver School New Valley Parents Association, and Donna P. Simpao, MD Health and Educational Consultancy. Before we get started, I want to briefly discuss the housekeeping rules. Okay, so just a reminder, this webinar is live streamed in our YouTube channel. Only the speakers videos will be spotlighted, but for your privacy, we suggest keeping your cameras and mics Only. off during the presentations. And um, while uh, the uh, we will have a question and answer portion at the end of um, the talk. So uh, you, you may ask your questions then, but if some questions come to mind as our presenters are talking, please feel free to use the chat for to type in your comments and suggestions. Um, the live stream will be stopped after the closing message. And we encourage everyone to stay behind after the closing message so that uh, we can have a, a, a group picture with everyone who are joining us via Zoom today. And for those of uh, for those of the for those of you who are watching via YouTube, thank you for joining us as well. And um, we hope that um, you learn a lot from our talk today. So I will now turn over the screen to our um, program director, Ms. Jolly Montanala, for the welcome remarks. Thank you so much, Teacher Lyra, and magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. My name is Jolly Montinola, and I am with the Reading Specialist Group. Thank you for joining us today on a Saturday morning. Um, in behalf of the Reading Specialists and our partners, I would like to welcome you to our Reading Matters webinar, Optimizing Reading in Remote Learning. Reading Matters is part of our advocacy to provide literacy for all through all. We believe that in order for children to reach their fullest potential, we must work collaboratively with everyone involved in the child's learning. That would be you, the parents, and the teachers. 
This morning, our two expert speakers will impart practical strategies to address difficulties in reading. They will also discuss the importance of early intervention and how to manage these conditions for long-term success. Our hope is that our speakers will be able to provide insight and ways we can optimize our literacy practices in the current remote learning environment. So without further delay, I'd like to turn you over to Mr. Frederick Perez, President of the Reading Association of the Philippines and Savior Schools Assistant Principal for Academics for our opening message. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that we are able to organize this webinar on optimizing reading and remote learning with the help of the reading specialists and other partner organizations. This is actually also a collaboration with the Reading Association of the Philippines Laguna chapter who have helped us also invite people in the area so that we can promote reading even in the remote uh, form of education. We also would like to thank the Savior School Parents Auxiliary in New Valley, who, who has been very supportive in our efforts to help parents and teachers in their endeavors during this new normal in education. First of all, I would like to tell you that remote learning really entails a lot of hard work from both teachers, and parents. In fact, we have invited Ms. Armitano and Ms. Hoxon to train our teachers. And we have seen as a school that it is important to share this with parents. That's why the collaboration with the Savior School Parents Auxiliary in Novali. And as school leaders, we also said that this can be shared with the greater up with a greater population like the people in Laguna and nearby provinces. I saw that we have many participants and there are even participants from Singapore, from Panga, and even in Mindanao. So thank you very much for gracing this webinar. Our speakers are experts in the field, especially in reading intervention, and they have long years of experience. And without further ado, I would like to, to, to tell you that I now have to introduce our, speaker, our first speaker. Rather. So our first speaker is a very good friend of mine. So we have known each other for around maybe six years. She joins us from Chicago, where she currently resides for part of the year. She holds two master's degrees from Columbia University in New York, one in elementary education, and the second in reading specialists. In 2004, she founded and built Reading Specialists, a literacy intervention center for children with learning disorders and reading difficulties. Reading Specialists has supported over 9,000 children since its inception 17 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, parents, literacy educators, Miss Maria Rona Ermitano or Teacher Vina. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric, for the very warm introduction. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, thank you for your commitment to learning and professional development. So. Okay. Um, I cannot seem to share my screen. Okay, here we are. Yeah. 
sorry, there's just some people still entering. So I just need to let them in. So we can just get a minute screen there. Okay, so I would like to begin today's presentation reading red flags in remote learning. Sorry. I just keep on seeing admit and I can't move my, all right, here. I would like to begin uh, today's presentation by discussing the importance of early identification um, discussing the developmental guide reading related skills and what we can do to find help for our children who have struggles with both word reading and comprehension. Okay. So lack of academic success is one of the consequences of late detection. 75% of children whose help is delayed at age nine or later continue to struggle throughout their school careers. Further, students who are poor readers in third grade are four times more likely to become high school dropouts compared to skilled readers. Such findings are not too surprising given that first to third grade is when children learn to read. Starting fourth grade, they are no longer learning to read but reading to learn. So if the reading skills are not yet in place at this point, no. then you definitely need to be cake and the same flavor. Even discouraging to keep up with the rapid pace of learning. Yeah, have Academic demands, after all, only become harder as they progress through the upper grades. When students do not become proficient readers in elementary school, they are at risk for problem behaviors as well as future delinquency. When students do not become so, proficient non-readers feel shame. Um, according to Judith uh, Packham, a reading specialist, um, the struggling reader doesn't want to know that he or she cannot read. So he refocuses the attention. He begins to misbehave. It is better to get in trouble for misbehaving than to risk other kids knowing that he cannot read. Another peril of late detection is the erosion of self-esteem and decreased motivation. According to Dr. Reed Leon of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, then he said, as we follow thousands of children with reading difficulties throughout their school careers and into young adulthood, these young people tell us how embarrassing and devastating it was to read with difficulty in front of peers and teachers and to demonstrate this weakness on a daily basis. It is clear from our research that this type of failure affects children negatively earlier than we thought. By the end of first grade, children having difficulty with beginning to read feel less positive about themselves than when they started school. So kapag hindi agad sila um, identify no, na nahihirapan, um, hindi na maganda yung tingin nila sa sarili nila, uh, sa sarili nila no? Uh, as they go through elementary and middle school, middle school, um, sometimes that's like grade six to eight. Okay, some would refer to it as grade six to seven. Okay, but during this time, um, self esteem and the motivation to learn to read decline even further. Poor readers lag far behind in the vocabulary development and in the acquisition of strategies for understanding what they read and they frequently avoid reading and other assignments that require reading. By high school, the potential of these students to enter college has decreased substantially. We want to catch struggling readers early to protect their self-esteem. Due to their reading difficulties, 
their self-belief is fragile as it is. But students are even more vulnerable when they do not immediately get help because no matter how intelligent and talented they are, if they do not believe in their own capabilities and completely have lost motivation to learn as a result of repeated failure, it becomes harder to get them back on track. So aside from that, um, uh, you know, the, the gap that they're trying to close in, with respect to their reading, they're also at that emotional layer so to deal with. And you can't get to the academics until you hurdle uh, that uh, emotional fear or fear of failure, right? Or not succeeding. So research shows as if that were not enough, no? yet another cause of late detection is decreased efficacy of intervention. Research shows that if help is given in fourth grade rather than in late kindergarten, it takes four times as long to improve the same skills by the same amount. We advocate for early intervention because effective early intervention yields optimal results. For example, 90% of children with reading difficulties will achieve grade level in reading if they receive help by first grade. This is possible since the brain is still plastic at a young age. Dr. Sally Shaywitz, a renowned doctor and neuroscientist in the field of dyslexia. Dyslexia, by the way, is uh, the difficulty with both reading, word reading and spelling, and it consists or com comprises 70 to 80% of reading disabilities, okay? A according to her, children should receive help by kindergarten and not later than first grade. I repeat, she says that children should receive help by kindergarten and not later than first grade. Pero yung nangyayari sa Pilipinas, naghihintay tayo hanggang grade three until we get them help. So results of a longitudinal study conducted by her and her team showed that gaps in reading achievement between good readers, that is the one represented by the solid line, and poor readers as represented by that broken line already exist in first grade, and that these persist through adolescence. So if this gap is to be narrowed or even closed, effective reading interventions must be implemented very early on. That said, I want us to examine more closely the costs involved between a false positive and a false negative. What is a false positive? Yung sinasabi nating merong problema pero wala naman pala. Yung false negative, sinasabi natin na ay walang problema pero meron pala. Okay, so the cost of a false positive or overdiagnosis is wasted resources such as time, money, effort. On the other hand, the costs of a false negative or underdiagnosis would include ayan, academic failure, lost opportunity to, to intervene when results are still optimal, right? And the brain is plastic. Social emotional costs such as low self esteem and decreased motivation. Wasted resources, as also in the false positive. And the most unconscionable cost being unfulfilled potential. So there in front of you, you will see a child who is undiagnosed would tr travel through that left path. And the child who is diagnosed would be successful, right? And the potential fulfilled. Um, Parents and teachers, you are critical. You are very, very important. I cannot even overemphasize that, yeah? Because you are so important because you are the student's first line of defense from falling through the cracks. It's important that we know what to watch out for to ensure that we catch these kids, these struggling readers before they fall, before they fail. But first, to understand for the milestones to make even more sense and for us to appreciate them better, I'd like to discuss the reading process. This way we see why phonological awareness skills and language development accomplishments play a significant role in the continuum, continuum of reading development. Okay, 
So this is the simple view of reading, uh, a model by Guff and Turnberg, uh, who proposed that reading comprehension is a product of D, decoding, and L, language comprehension. So decoding is the ability to pronounce the printed words correctly. But of course, common sense will tell us that that's, there's more to reading than just merely palating the words. No? Sinasabi lang na, binabasa lang natin. Okay, the other component, language comprehension, is our listening comprehension, as it's also called, refers to an understanding of vocabulary and grammar. Dapat naunawaan rin natin yung ating binabasa. Okay, so let's say, uh, Filipino speaker ka, hindi ka ganun ka proficient or kahusay sa Ingles, maaaring yung mas maganda yung uh, language comprehension mo sa Filipino compared to English and vice versa. Kung English naman yung first language mo, maaaring hindi ka rin masyadong mahusay yung L mo, mababa, or hindi ganun kataas um, sa Filipino. So, uh, those also with language impairments, yung mga nahihirapan umunawa, whether even in their first language, yan. Yan yung mga at risk for also having a low language comprehension. And as a result, we'll have poor reading comprehension. Okay. Now notice that the simple view of reading is in the form of a multiplication equation. Since we know that in multiplication, anything multiplied by zero equals zero, we can conclude that if decoding is zero, or L is zero, or both D and L are zero, okay, reading comprehension will be zero. In order to have good reading comprehension, students should not only be able to decipher words on a page well or mabasa nila yung mga uh, titik or yung mga salita sa pahin ng binabasa nila, pero dapat proficient rin sila, dapat naiintindihan nila yung kanilang binabasa. How well students decode as well as understand language is, predict is predictive of reading comprehension which is the ultimate goal of reading, no? meaning making. And that said, we want to keep a close eye on how their word reading skills develop as well as uh, their language skills. And by that, yung kanilang listening ability to understand uh, and speak. No? Um, interestingly, okay, this is a very a good, interesting fact. Children with a history of oral language impairment are more likely to present with reading difficulties than their peers. Some research identified increased likelihood to be as four to five times more likely than their peers. This idea that expressive language impacts reading achievement is likewise shared by Dr. Louise Spears Whirling, an expert in beginning literacy. She says, Receptive vocabulary involves understanding words. Okay, receptive, yung pag-unawa, incoming information. Receptive vocabulary is yung pag-iintindi ng salita. Expressive vocabulary involves using or naming a word. So paano natin hindi lang umunawa, pero gamitin ito sa ating pananalita. Although the relationship of receptive vocabulary to reading comprehension seems obvious, Okay, so meaning if you have good receptive vocabulary, most likely you'll have good reading comprehension, right? But actually they find that expressive vocabulary, how you use words, appears to be an even stronger predictor of beginning reading achievement yeah? compared to receptive vocabulary. So when we look at students' linguistic development, we do not only want to check for how well they acquire, understand, and receive language. We also want to observe how they use it to express themselves and their thoughts, both orally and in written form. And since listening and speaking develop ahead of reading and writing, we don't need for children to struggle with reading before we get them help. If oral language development is found to be atypical, meaning it's not developing normally, no? Kunyari, grade 3 na sila, tapos parang cryptic or telegraphic sila magsalita. Ako, punta SM. Punta tayo SM kain, you know? That is not normal, okay? And they are at risk, definitely, for reading difficulties. 
um, the child must therefore be immediately referred to an evaluation since such delays just puts them at greater risk for reading difficulties. Having established that decoding okay, and language development need to be monitored, what do we need to watch out for? We have to make sure that the phonological awareness skills, I will get to this, uh, I will elaborate on this. We have to ensure that the phonological awareness skills develop according to expectation because it is critical to both reading and spelling development. Those who have word reading difficulties like dyslexics have poor or weak phonological awareness skills. Okay, so it's enough. Uh, what is phonological awareness skills, right? Okay, phonological awareness is the awareness of the segmental nature of language. Na ito yung uh, alam natin na ang language, ang pagnanalita, ang lingwahe, ay maaari natin pang hatiin. We can break it down further into smaller parts. Okay, kasi initially, children think of speech as a stream of words, like an endless roll of film. But as they get older, they increasingly become more sensitive to the smaller linguistic units of speech. And what do we mean by that? You know, during the preschool years, if parents, if you're not wondering, why do they keep on saying, read to your child, read uh, a lot of rhymes? I never really also understood that myself, um, except that what you're trying to do is to sensitize children to the sounds of the language, to immerse them in the sounds, okay? And so they have a beginning appreciation of rhyme and alliteration, right? The repeating first sound. Okay, like, um, so um, they start to realize also uh, from here that sentences can be broken up into words, right? And that words further into syllables, like you see on your computer, computer, right? And syllables further into onset rhyme. In on when we talk about onset rhymes, we talk about, we're referring to one syllable words. Starting from the, from the vowel, uh, going to the right, that would be your uh, rhyme, R-I-M-E, and all the consonants prior to that or consonant before your vowel would be your onset, okay? So the rhymes would be essentially like your word families. You Onset rhymes can even be further broken down into individual sounds or phonemes. The phoneme is the smallest meaningful unit of speech. And another concept about phonological awareness, besides that it's the awareness that language can be broken up into smaller, from bigger to smaller units, okay? Phonological awareness is also being able to manipulate these units. Okay, so as you can see, there are five levels of phonological awareness, starting from the simple to the more complex tasks. You can rhyme words by changing the onset, you can separate words, uh, sentences into words. You can segment words into syllables. You can also blend them. Like, what word do these sounds make? Hero. Then it's hero. Yeah, that's blending. What uh, syllabicate hero? Hero. So that's what we mean. And then you can also blend onset uh, uh, rhymes, right? What does m at make? That's mat. And you can also separate that into its onset and rhyme. What is the, uh, separate the onset rhyme of mat. It's m at, okay. You can also blend and segment at the level of individual sounds or phonemes with the most complex tasks being manipulation like you see at the bottom, deleting sounds within words. Say mat without m, that would be at. Substitution would be uh, uh, say mat, uh, change m to s, that would be sat, right? Okay. So just to differentiate, okay, and many, because many tend to confuse phonological awareness with phonemic awareness, when we talk about linguistic units from the biggest, meaning from here at the bottom of the stair, up to here, the topmost stair, when we talk about all these linguistic units, that's referring to phonological awareness. But when you're just referring and manipulating them, 
at each of these levels. But when you're just talking about this big stair up here and manipulating at the level of sound only, individual sound, whether you're blending, segmenting, deleting, substituting, that is phonemic awareness. Okay. So essentially, uh, just to reiterate, phonemic awareness is under the umbrella of phonological awareness. So magkakasama itong lahat ng green. It's all under phonological awareness. Um, but phonemic awareness actually is the strongest predictor of early reading achievement. And why is that? Well, I just want, uh, because what, when we're, teaching students, right? Um, C is, stands, represents K. The letter C symbol stands for the K in cat. So you're teaching them like all these keywords to unlock the sound. But unless the child has phonemic awareness and hears that first sound, what is the initial sound in cat? It's K. Unless they're able to hear the K in the word cat, that squiggle that you're showing them, it wouldn't make sense to them, right? So you would, we need phonemic awareness for them to have an appreciation for phonics instruction, okay? So according to Dr. Shavitz, phonological awareness is not an end in itself. It's important because we want them to see the relationship of letters to sounds. So all your phonics instruction, teach, teaching them how letters, these symbols, attach to sounds, which they need in order to read, it will only make sense if they have an awareness at the, at the sound level. Okay, so they need that to become a good reader. So a while ago, we were talking about the reading process, right? And what we should be closely monitoring. One is phonological awareness. Once children begin to be aware of phonemes or the sounds in their language, they are ready to learn how letters attach to them for reading. If their phonemic awareness skills are not catching on, for example, you'll see later on that they should be learning how to rhyme at five years old. We encounter students who are not even rhyming at age seven or nine years old, right? So that is a red flag. So besides phonological awareness, we, want to we also want to watch out for how well their alphabet knowledge is progressing. Are they learning the letter names and sounds? With respect to word recognition, how well can they read words in isolation? Can they read multisyllabic words by second grade? Do they have problems with learning sight words? Non read nonsense words, right? Because they sound magbasa, So to circumvent that, pinapabasa namin ng mga um, nonsense words, no? Words they have not, so that you can really stress their knowledge of letter sound uh, correspondence. Fluency, Do the, does the student read accurately, automatically, smoothly, and with proper phrasing and expression, or is it slow and labored? Teacher CJ will elaborate on fluency uh, later on. Um, in terms of linguistic comprehension, do they have problems acquiring new vocabulary, even in their first language? No. Do they have problems understanding figures of speech, making inferences, or are they too literal in their way of thinking, even like when they encounter idiomatic expressions, let's say they don't get it, right? Or jokes. Um, grammar, how well do they understand oral discourse? Can they follow directions, verbal directions? Are there verbalizations, yung mga for sentence formulation nila, tuwid, baluktot, you know? When you're young, like four years old, I go to school is appropriate for a preschooler but definitely not for a third grader, which I've seen even in English, I mean, even among Americans, no? they say that. That means they have a language-based learning difficulty and therefore probably have problems also with reading. Um, the following milestones I'll be uh, providing are by no means exhaustive, but I've chosen to highlight those that relate to reading. And the sources I've drawn from, in addition to Dr. Sally Shavitz's um, book, Overcoming Dyslexia uh, is also ASHA.org, which is American Speech Language Hearing Association, and CDC.gov, which stands for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Those who are at risk for reading difficulties do not include, do not only include those who have weak phonological awareness skills, but also those who have problems 
with understanding and or using language. I will be presenting the developmental sequence of phonological awareness skills in which 80 to 90% of students are expected to have achieved by the ages indicated. I just want to underscore that when you do phonological awareness activities, these are purely auditory. Parents and teachers, purely auditory. The kids can, or students can look at pictures, but they're not seeing letters at this point. Okay, so this would actually, phonological awareness would fall under listening comprehension activities. Um, and to liven things up a bit, may you please answer the following uh, questions I will be asking in your head, okay, as I go through the slides. Which two rhyme is it? Um, okay, which two rhyme? Bat, bug, hat. How many syllables are there in dog? How many syllables are there in turtle? By age five, the expectation is they should be able to recognize rhyme and count syllables. What word do these sounds make? B, oat. What, may, what word do these sounds make? K, up. What word rhymes with cat? Say the first sound in net. So by age five and a half, they should be able to blend onset and rhyme. Rhyme provide, isolate the beginning sound in words. Now say tulip. Say tulip without two. Now what word do these sounds make? B, ow. What word do these words make, sounds make? S, a, uh, n. See the sounds in both. You can also hold up a finger for each sound you hear. B, O, B, O, T. So by age six, they are expected to delete syllables within words, blend words with two to three sounds, and separate words with two to three sounds. Now, say the sounds in black. You should have been, you should have said B, B, A, K. Now say cat. Change K to B. What word did you get? Okay, so if you answered back, that's correct. By age six and a half, children should be able to segment words with up to three to four phonemes, say this, and engage in more complex phonological awareness tasks, such as phoneme substitution. Um, and so now uh, try this, say seed, say it again without D. So that would be C, right? So age seven, they are able to delete phonemes in the initial and final positions. Now try this one, say sled. Say it again, but don't say s. At eight years old, they are able to delete sound in the initial position of words with blends. Now say snail. Say it again without n. If you answered sail, that's correct. At age nine, they can delete phonemes in the medial and final blend positions. Now, let's look at the accomplishments expected of children with respect to reading, listening, speaking, and writing, writing once applicable, right? Um, early preschool ages, three to four, in terms of mastering the alphabet, they should be able to identify at least 10 alphabet letters, mostly from their name. They should be able to answer who, what, where questions, because some kids may be echolalic, meaning they just repeat the question asked of them because they do not understand what they are being asked but yet they know they need to say something. Um, they may also give the wrong kind of answer to a specific question type. For example, they may answer a when question, like when did you go? And they would answer with a where, no? like they would might say to the park. Uh, at this age, they should also be able to follow through the three step, three step instructions, like take a bath and go to bed. Um, they should be able to understand words such as in, on, under, terminology for shapes like circle, square. They should uh, have clear speech. 
So if they are speaking incoherently, that would be a red flag. They use pronouns such as I, me, we, and you correctly. They use plurals like dogs, cats, toys, buses, and they speak in sentences. Because at this point, we should already be able to put four words together. Huh? Uh, I go to school and is normal at this point and carry on a conversation using two to three sentences. Okay. Now, um, late preschool age four to five, they recognize and name a growing number of alphabet letters. So they understand mostly what is heard at home and, and in school, such as three-part commands. For example, put your pajamas on, brush your teeth, and pick out a book. Draw a circle on your paper around something you like to read. In terms of speaking, they can say their first and last, i sorry, um, they understand first, next, last, yesterday, today, tomorrow, and same versus different. They can say their first and last name, use pronouns he, she, me, you correctly. They can tell story and scribble. Um, by early, uh, by here we are in kindergarten, ages five to six. Kindergarten with age five to five and a half, they're about naming all about almost all upper and lowercase letters. They kindergarten, they should be able to name all alphabet letters and identify almost all letter sounds. They begin to decode simple words, recognize a few sight words such as, such as you, are, is, the. Uh, writing, they use invented spelling, um, such as the examples that you see, you know, that's car, kind, because, right? Those Right, they can write many uppercase and lowercase letters. They can write their own name and names of family members and pets. Uh, by first grade, ages six to seven, they read aloud with accuracy one syllable words. Um, they read aloud with accuracy and comprehension, grade appropriate texts. They read regularly and monitors what is read by self correcting using the cues provided by letters or context surrounding the word. They can spell short, easy words, such as that you see on screen, those you see on screen. Um, age, second grade, age just seven to eight, they uh, read more and more words fluently to include multi-syllabic real non and nonsense words like Kalamazoo. They're able to read and comprehend second grade uh, fiction and nonfiction. They read voluntarily. So if they avoid reading at all costs, they say, constantly say it's boring, tiring, it could be a red flag taken with other symptoms no, or signs. Um, writing, they represent the complete sound of a word now in spelling, okay? Uh, missing vowels or letters in consonant blends could be a red flag. Sometimes they don't spell well because they may have dyslexia, attentional issues, or both, okay? Uh, third grade, ages eight to nine, they read aloud with fluency and comprehension. Any text meant for third grade, uh, they read longer fictional se selections and chapter books. They summarize the main points from their reading. They use, have knowledge, they use their knowledge of affixes and roots to infer word meaning, and they correctly uh, spell previously studied word. Okay. Here are just a few points I wish to make regarding reading red flags in remote learning. We do not lower our standards because of the pandemic. Children may, uh, benchmarks are the same. Huh? Children may exhibit delays, possibly due to their restrictions or language processing issues. But our job as teachers is not to diagnose, right? It's to look for patterns in difficulties for the basis of our referral or for our teaching, okay? It's our job to address students' literacy needs. Okay, which is why actually also during this time, assessment is also important um, because by establishing baseline measures, especially as we begin the new school year, right? I'm sure there's really learning loss, um, but we still want to know, right? In what areas kulang, yeah? Um, then um, teacher creativity is also critical. We have to be creative. Um, to engage students. Uh, this way, we also have a more accurate sense of where they're at. Um, so we also want to think, um, let's say you have a big class size. Um, 
how are we going to give them more opportunities to speak, listen, read, and get samples of their writing, right? To gain insight into how their skills are, right? Okay. Okay, so this is just like talking about creativity. This is just how a few slides to show you how we do um, show them rhyming, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, ball, wall, do they rhyme? Thumbs up, thumbs down, right? Um, we teach them blending. So for example, yeah, we tell them k at, what word this, if you're doing onset rhyme, then you have that star. Um, as you can see, teachers pay teachers. That was from teachers pay, pay teachers. Okay. Yeah. So, um, admittedly, there are limitations to online learning. Yeah. Um, I know that some of my colleagues also um, uh, said that um, there are limitations to, because there are limitations to online learning, right? Um, we just also have to prioritize. For example, um, uh, my colleagues have a hard time teaching, let's say, handwriting. How do you do that on through online learning? Okay. So that said, you have to prioritize your goals. What are the things that you can work on and focus on what you can control? At the same time, this is where also partnerships uh, with parents really are important um, because um, more than ever, we need home support to reinforce what is being taught and provide to provide us with pictures of students' work. Okay, I know that an, uh, an issue for many is that some school administrators and teachers are get concerned because um, sometimes they don't get a sense of what the kids are capable of because the parents super over help. Uh, so that's something you may want to also um, address. And parents, you are, you are you hear us talk about this. So you know, just so are, we're able to not rob them also of the opportunity to learn. So given the child is not meeting many of the prescribed milestones, what would be the next step? Um, we, I would like to discuss briefly the referral process as we see it in the Philippine setting. And this is it, you know, when, uh, a child is not behaving or developing as expected, we bring them to a developmental pediatrician, right? So, and the pediatrician, the arrows point to whom the specialist they refer to. So um, they are trained in pediatrics and take additional three years of training to specialize in developmental and behavioral problems. Um, so whenever a child or patient is brought to them, they should be able to make a diagnosis. Um, depending on the presenting uh, difficulty. So if problems with reading, they'd refer to a reading specialist, if with speech, then speech and language pathologist, right? Now, if the student has been diagnosed with a reading or disorder, what program do we recommend to parents? What are the characteristics of an effective reading intervention program? Okay, so I'd just like to discuss that very briefly. What were the characteristics of a re the effective reading intervention program be? So that would be not in, only important is the content, but also how, how it's delivered and the frequency. So the components of an effective reading program would be phonemic awareness, which we discussed earlier, teaching phonics, teaching letter sound relationships, teaching uh, vocabulary and comprehension. And if you can see fluency sits right between decoding and language comprehension, you know, the two big components for effective reading comprehension, right? So fluency, you need that because to comprehend well, students must be able to read fluently, um, but to read fluently, students also need to comprehend or understand what they are reading, okay? So, um, so, Effective reading intervention program should not include only teaching reading, but also writing, because these are reciprocal processes, right? Um, um, integrating both reading and written expression makes sense, since it's also being exposed to literature that children get ideas to write about. Um, 
Most phonics programs teach reading alongside with spelling because they both draw from the same knowledge of letter-sound relationships. Research also shows that spelling supports a development of phonemic awareness and word recognition. So equally important as to what or the content, like I said, is how instruction is delivered. Teaching should be direct and explicit, meaning nothing is left to chance. It should be systematic, meaning it follows a progression from simple to complex. Okay, so let's say you're teaching a phonics program, it should begin with alphabet letters before you proceed to consonant digraphs or consonant blends, moving on to more complex letter patterns like AI, EA, EIGH. It should also naturally also be delivered by a qualified professional with experience in teaching those with reading disabilities. Um, finally, sufficient duration and intensity. According to Dr. Shaywitz, a child with dyslexia is not, who is not diagnosed early may require as much as 100 to 150 to 300 hours of intensive instruction. Uh, that's at least 60 minutes, optimally 90 minutes or more for most school days over a one to three period if the reading gap is to be closed. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I hope I'm not over time here, um, but just to summarize the importance of early identification is to receive early intervention, to succeed in school, preserve self-esteem, and for our children to live a happy, fulfilling life uh, despite struggles, right? Despite the struggles with, with literacy learning. Um, we hope that the developmental guide to reading related skills with respect to listening, speaking, reading, and writing can help identify those who are at risk and struggling readers, hopefully not later than first grade. And this we do by observing their receptive language input, right? How well do they understand incoming information, whether that's through listening or reading. And we also observe their expressive language, meaning how they articulate themselves both orally and in written form. Finally, when we have concerns regarding a child's development, we usually refer them to a developmental pediatrician who recommends which therapists or specialists to see. An effective reading intervention program begins with an early diagnosis and intervention. Uh, not only is content important, but how instruction is delivered and the frequency and duration intensity. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rina, for that um, very informative um, session. So there are a few questions that were uh, that came up in the chat, and uh, I will ask you these questions during the Q and A portion after Ms. CJ's talk. Okay, so to introduce our next speaker, I would like to call on uh, Ms. Grace Molina, uh, Save Your Parents. Association president uh, for to introduce our next speaker. Hello, good morning, everybody. So before we start, you know, I wanted to say hi to my crowd. Alam mo, Jolie, kalahati ata ng mga guests niyo ngayon, mga katropa ko yan. So we've invited, maybe, I guess, the entire Savior community to join us today. So I wanted to say hi and hello to all my XSPA and crowd. Thank you for supporting. Now, um, Jolie, um, the director of this program, was talking to us about how enthusiastic we are. Okay, um, XSPAN is really an ex enthusiastic group. Why? Because our president reminded us that we are parents are prophets by vocation. So it's really our role to inspire our children to be better students, okay? So I love this. When this was presented to me, I love the idea that we are able to um, do this at home with them, you know, uh, at least inspire them and teach them and learn with them. Um, let me introduce to you the second part of this talk. It's, um, it's I, I know it's it, it's kind of cerebral at first, you know, I was, I was listening to it, but it's very interesting. Um, Rina was uh, was talking about how how we should be um, involved from the very beginning. Let me share with you a quick story. When my I have an eighteen year old, and when she was about to turn one, I panicked. She couldn't walk yet, and she couldn't read or talk. 
So I sent her to reading specialist. So, and you know what? She's a medalist. So, you know, I don't know. I'm sure it has something to do with that, you know, but the encouragement, the happy environment, I'm sure that's what makes her succeed. Um, and, you know, let's take this further down the road. You know, let's talk about oral fluency. They're good to read, but are they able to speak properly? Let me introduce to you Cecil Hoxon. Now, Ms. Cecil Hoxon obtained her reading certificate from the University of California, San Diego Extension. Ang haba ng ano niya, ng kanyang credentials, no? Um, she, but most importantly, she actually com um, completed her academic units in special education from the University of the Philippines, Dil Diliman. But more than that, she also, well, has academic units from the reading education from Ad Ateneo. Of course, the best of wor both worlds, the right? UP and Ateneo. She taught preschool and elementary students and served as a special education teacher for some years in California and Florida. And, um, you know, teacher CJ, known by, well, most of her students call her teacher CJ, is also currently the director of Reading Specialist, where she has been happy helping students with reading difficulties for 13 years. Um, there, so wh what else can we look for? We have the best speakers in this in this talk. Let's all learn from them. Let's all learn from her and put it to practice after this. Can we call um, teacher CJ? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the warm welcome and for inviting the whole Savior community to join us. Thank you, Miss Grace Molina. And I'm so happy to see you again after more than, I'm sure, 10 years, I think. So if I remember right, we are still in the old building. So happy to see you again. And thank you very much also, Teacher Rina, for that very informative talk on reading red flags, the importance of early intervention, uh, language and reading milestones, characteristics of an effective instruction, and um, on phonological awareness skills, which are very critical to reading. Good morning, teachers, parents, educators. Thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us and for your interest in developing the uh, literacy skills of our children. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. I will just share my slides. Excuse me. Share screen. Am I sharing the slide? No, I'm not. Again, share slide. Okay, good morning. So am I sharing already? I hope I am. My talk will focus on reading fluency. One minute, please. I will just fix something. Can you, there, one minute. Let me just fix something here. Thank you. So my talk will focus on oral reading fluency, which is one of the five components of reading according to the National Reading Panel. So the other four are uh, phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, and comprehension. And today we are going to define what fluency is, uh, provide strategies on how we can help our students become fluent readers. And we are also going to suggest some texts that you can use to monitor your children's or your students' fluency. So let's start with the definition. Uh, what is fluency? What is reading fluency? It's the ability to decode text accurately to read at an acceptable rate and to read aloud with an appropriate expression. So that the words that come to mind are effortless and natural. Para lang nagsasalita yung pagbasa ng bata. So someone who makes a lot of mistakes, uh, reads um, in a word per word manner, very choppy, and lacks expression and phrasing, is not exactly considered a fluent reader. So again, what is fluency? The three components are 
accuracy or tamang pagbasa ng mga salita, automaticity, tamang bilis. Hindi kailangan mabilis na mabilis. Ang importante dyan ay yung tamang bilis. Hindi rin mabagal. At prosody, pagbasa na may tamang damdamin o tono. Ito pala. Accuracy, automaticity, rate, and prosody. And then briefly, let's uh, discuss each component. So accuracy is the ability to recognize and pronounce written words correctly. It is the uh, ability to apply one's knowledge of phonological awareness, phon phonemic awareness, letter sound correspondence, vowel themes, and sight word reading. So kapag may mga halimbawa, salitang nasa harapan ng isang bata, salit, halimbawa yung mga titik na B-O-A-T. So kailangan pagpapagsamahin ng ang bata yung kaalaman niya sa phonemic awareness or blending putting sounds together. Yung alam, kaalaman niya sa vowel themes. B-O. Dapat alam niya na pag ang B-O, kadalasan pag magkasama ang sound O. So pag binasa niya to, ang tamang pagbasa dapat boat, hindi bot, o hindi bat. So accuracy is also the foundation of fluency because you're able to construct Meaning, when you're able to read words correctly and fluently. And so now, ano ba ang tamang basehan natin ng accuracy? Sabi nila, ang reasonably accurate ay 95% accuracy. So what does 95 accuracy mean? Um, let's say you have a passage with 100 words. The student should be able to read at least 95 of those words correctly. And why 95? Parang limang mali lang yung pwede. Lima or less. Kasi this is so the reader can sufficiently access the meaning of the text and enjoy the process of reading. Hindi siya nahihirapan magbasa. Relax lang. So parang ito yung sinasabi nila na independent reading level. Uh, the child is reading for enjoyment. And then... Um, if a child makes around... Um, 10 mistakes, that is the child's instructional level. So this would be the passage you could use when working with your child or student for fluency instruction. It's challenging but manageable, and it's good for practicing for rate and expression. However, if it is, if a child, when presented with a 100-word passage, reads at more than 10 mistakes, then that is too difficult for the child, uh, that's considered his frustration level. So dito, uh, kung maalala mo sa Goldilocks rule, sa Goldilocks, meron tayong tinatawag na Goldilocks rule. So yung, yung instructional level or 90% accuracy, yun ang tinatawag nila na just right. Yun ang tamang passage lang. So, kunwari, kumuha siguro kayo ng textbook ng anak niyo or ng student, yung level niya, kunwari, grade for yung anak niyo or grade 3, then get a grade 3 textbook get a paragraph there and then monitor his reading for accuracy. And that's how you'll find out if that is the correct uh, passage for your child. So again, so automat uh, and then the next component is automaticity or rate, which is the ability to recognize or decode words effortlessly and accurately. So automatic recognition dapat. Yung kasi hindi yung pinakita mo, let's say, C-A-T, hindi niya sasabihin k at Tapos pag uh, sasama, samahin pa niya yung sounds. Kasi pag yung atensyon ng bata, napupunta sa kaka-decode, kaka-sound out ng bawat letra, nababawasan yung atensyon niya sa pag-intindi ng binabasa niya. So kapag automatic yung pagbasa, mas maraming um, atensyon ang nabibigay sa pag-unawa ng binabasa or pinatawag natin na comprehension. So, mas may sense yung kanyang binabasa pag automatic ang pagbasa ng mga salita. Dahil uh, sinabi natin ang automaticity ay uh, tamang pagbasa ng tamang bilis. So, kailangan natin tandaan na faster is not always better. Okay. Uh, it is not uh, at the reading, uh, observing proper speed, or reading, observing automaticity is not only 
about speed. However, we should um, take note that effortless reading requires practice, especially for those who are just learning to read. But then comprehension is also important. Uh, comprehension is actually very important when we read. So um, while it is important for students to read fast, we should also remember that fluency is not only about speed. Malaki ang natutulong ng tamang bilis ng pagbasa. Kaya sobrang bagal, word per word, nakaka-affect so, sa pag-unawa ng kwento. Pero ganun rin kapag sobrang bilis naman. Sobrang bilis na ang nangyayari, nalilimutan na niyang basahin, nakakaliktaan na niyang basahin yung isang titik, minsan buong linya, minsan walang preno, walang punctuation, tuloy-tuloy. So, do you think na intindihan rin niya yung binasa niya? Halos magkapareho lang sila sa batang nagbabasa ng sobrang bilis or sobrang bagal. Do you think they really, really understood what they read? And so, so if a student thinks that faster is better, he may not attend to meaning. Students should be able to read at a pace where they mind punctuation, tone, expression. So this brings us to the third component, which is prosody, reading with expression, intonation, tone, stress. So intonation, you um, adjusting your voice and volume to match the meaning of the text. Tone is reading to show an expression or feeling. And stress is uh, when you emphasize certain words and phrases. When you read too slow or too fast, you're not exactly reading with expression. But when you vary your intonation, you read certain words with feelings, you pause, you observe punctuation, you demonstrate. <laughs> You demonstrate that you understand what you're reading. So you add meaning to the text when you read with expression. Puro ko you add meaning, you add meaning. Kasi nga, kailangan na intindihan natin yung binabasa natin. And so now, what is the significance of fluency? Why should we teach fluency? Why should we develop fluent readers? Fluency is the foundation for reading success. And it is the bridge between word recognition and reading comprehension. And studies have shown that a strong connection between reading fluency and general measures of achievement, uh, in, stud, uh, um, studies have shown that there is a strong connection between reading fluency and general measures of achievement, including comprehension. Kasi nga, lahat ng effort sa pagbasa napupunta sa pag-unawa ng binabasa, ng text, ng passage, ng kwento. And so now let's go to strategies. Let's talk about strategies. My main source for the four strategies that we are going to discuss will be from Timothy Rasinski's books. Uh, one is The Fluent Reader and the other is The Mega Book of Fluency Strategies. So there will be four strategies. And the first is to model good oral reading. If we want our students to be fluent readers, they may have to hear what fluent reading is all about. At kanino nila maririnig ito? Siyempre, sa mga magulang, sa mga guro, kayo, tayo. The parents and the teachers are the best models of fluent reading. So paano nangyari? Paano tayo naging models of fluent reading? Kasi when we read aloud, we read with expression. And then they learn that when they read, they too must also read with expression. And at the same time, we should also explain, uh, discuss with them what fluent reading is all about. So, so period, post tayo. So, so what exactly are the goals of reading aloud? I will just focus on three. Of course, there are definitely more than three. So first is it improves comprehension and vocabulary. Next is it increases fluency. And the third is it builds motivation. So when you read aloud to your students, to your children, you most of the time read stories that are probably above their reading level. Siguro hindi natin talaga ginagawang read aloud stories yung mga CBC books na mga The Cat Sat on the Mat. Hindi natin siguro binabasa yung mga ganon. Siguro mas advanced. So parang when these are the books that 
we expose to our children and to our students, they are exposed to rich language and more vocabulary words. So when this happens, by the time they see the word in print, when they are able to read the same words in the stories, they've been exposed to it because they've already heard it before. But I alam ko ibig sabihin yan, narinig ko na yan. So the more vocabulary words they know, the better their understanding of the story. So may isang poster tungkol dito. Uh, Jim Trellis wrote a book about the Read Aloud Handbook. And then um, he has a poster that says this. How can you speak, read, or write the word if you've never heard the word? Diba? Makes sense. So, Kaya important yung Read Aloud kasi talagang na-expose sila sa mga kwento. Another reason for... Uh, Um, I mean, another reason on how it improves comprehension and vocabulary is constantly reading to our students and children will expose them to the elements of a story. So if you frequently read to them narratives, they will somehow figure out that stories have characters. There is a setting. Kadalasan may problema na throughout the book, sinusubukan na lunasan yung problema. And then towards the end, may solution na. So na, nakikita nila yon And then later on, I'm sure that they will be sharing their um, opinions, their inferences on what's going to happen to the story. So it just really helps them with these things. And later on, I'm sure it will also help them uh, write stories. And uh, another um, goal of um, reading aloud to our students and children is it increases fluency. So when we read aloud, we are sending a message to our students and children about reading with expression, using proper tone, phrasing, pausing at appropriate points. We are actually modeling what meaningful reading is all about. And the third one is it builds motivation. Being read to is an enjoyable experience. So it nurtures the desire to read on their own. I'm sure as teachers and parents, you have experienced this, that children are always excited when it comes to read aloud. Um, I teach a small group of students. So I we teach both small groups and one-on-one -on -one online. And then, hindi talaga pwedeng walang read aloud sa bawat session namin. Hindi talaga hahanapin at hahanapin nila yun. Parang, Parang bawal talaga yon sa, 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 sa mga students ko. Kahanapin nila yan. So talagang um, it really builds motivation. It nurtures the desire to read and to read on their own. And then um, siguro when we had, uh, when you were in the classroom teaching, you will probably notice that they will want to borrow the book that you just read to them and then bring home a book and then just read. Um, I have these two books here, Frog on the Log, and it's not easy being a bunny because I just read these books um, the past few days. Frog on the Log, um, too, because we were working on rhymes and it's not be easy being a bunny. It's a read aloud activity with some writing activity. And then um, it turns out that these students of mine, some of them had these books sa shelf nila. So parang tuwang tuwa sila nung nakita nila na kasama siya sa read aloud namin that day. So nung next session, kinuha nila, tapos gusto nila basahin ulit. Uh, yun ulit yung read aloud kasi gusto na nila, sasabayan na nila, nag nagaganyan na sila, nagpo-point to each word. So hindi na siya isang libro na nakatago lang sa shelf nila. Meron pala sila, tapos ngayon binubuksan nila, binabasa na nila. So now, how do we read aloud? Well, it would be nice, um, especially for teachers. As parents, I guess, Um, reading aloud is so important. But for teachers, practice is very important. It's um, wise to first read the book, look at the book, select the book before reading them. Hindi lang siya kinukuha five minutes bago, may five minutes pa yung klasik. Siyempre alam ko yan kasi ginawa ko yan noon, okay? Kaya alam na alam ko yan na, ay, meron pang five minutes bago mag-dismissal, kukuha ko ng book, mag-read aloud ako. Hindi. Kailangan talaga mag-practice and the reason is, um, We have to know when to pause, when to read with expression, when to um, increase our tone and our volume. It will also help us 
ask questions as we read because it's um, important to be models also of thinking aloud when reading to kids because our students should also develop that habit of reading aloud, of thinking aloud. So when you read to them, demonstrate it to them. Like, ah, I wonder what will happen next. I, I, bakit nangyari ito? And then later on, this, your students and children will be doing the same thing. They will be doing the, read, the thinking aloud. Another thing to do, another recommendation when we read aloud is to have some reading response activities. Very simple lang. So... Um, let's say um, I have some activities that we just did before. Okay, one is um, last March when it was Dr. Seuss's month, we read this, um, I'm not going to get up today. And so our reading response activity is so then what will you do? So one note, watch Frozen, play date, and do scooter. And then with It's Not Easy Being a Bunny, which we just did, I think, last Monday. Today's first Saturday, no? Monday, Tuesday. So. Uh, the reading response activity was, because this is about a bunny who didn't really like being a bunny. And so I asked, um, if you were not a bunny, uh, if you were an animal, what would you be? Simple question lang, di ba? I, uh, isa, uh, well, sabi, niya, sabi ko animal, eh, pero ang sagot niya, unicorn, so I can fly, and the other one is dog, so I can fetch stick. There. And there is here, we have another poster by the same guy who wrote the book, The Read Aloud Handbook, and his name, as I mentioned, is Jim Trellis. Since we are on the topic of reading aloud, I think mothers, parents, teachers, we should encourage daddies to do the reading aloud. Okay, hindi lagi yung nana, yung tita, yung caregiver, yung adult. Kasi sabi nila, um, it's no surprise when dads are involved, kids make better sandcastles. Uh, they said that um, the better the sand, uh, if children make or build very good sandcastles, it's because the dad helps them. So it's the same way with reading. And research shows when dads are involved with books, kids, especially boys, make better grades. Pick it up, dad. So kindly um, show this poster to your husbands or brothers, or granddads. So now we are going to the next strategy. So first was you were modeling good reading. Um, the next strategy is providing oral support. Simply reading aloud to students will not make them fluent readers. They need to engage in reading. So when they do, some may not automatically become fluent readers on their own. Hindi naman siya, minabasaan ko naman yung anak ko, ba't hindi marunong magbasa? Hindi siya automatic. Okay, they will need support. So what then is oral support? Or uh, providing oral support is um, transitioning from modeling to independent. So you were modeling them what fluent reading is, and then now we they are in the transition from that point into becoming independent readers. So between modeling, this is in between modeling and um, independent fluent readers. So sa, sa gitna na yon, we have to support and assist them. So one way of doing this is through assisted reading. So there. So this is when you provide direct support to the student as he reads. So this is what we call also, as I mentioned, assistant reading, and what is assisted or supportive reading. It's when a student reads a passage while listening to a reading of the same passage. So we are going to share two ways of um, assisted or supportive reading. One is shared reading, and one is choral reading. So shared reading, if you will notice, there is a teacher reading aloud to the class, but ideally, Siyempre, mas maganda kung big book, okay? And then, um, it seems that she is pointing to some words. Because the teacher will read first, and then uh, she will read again, and this time, the students will join in the reading of the book. It doesn't have to be the whole book. Let's say you're taking up sight words, then she will point the sight words that you're taking up. 
Okay, so pointing. So teacher will read first and then later on the students will read along with the teacher. And then um, as a parent, you can do this also definitely with your child. Read first and then, oh, let's read together by uh, pointing to some of the words, especially if the kid has learned some new words. So an example, what kinds of books are appropriate or are recommended for um, shared reading? Books with uh, repeated words, phrases, and sentences will help a lot. For example, books by Bill Martin Jr. and Eric Carl. Let's say brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? So madami siya eh. Madami yata klase to. So let's say what the, one of the more popular ones is brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. And so maybe since there's a pattern, your child, your student can follow along. Red bird, red bird, what do you see? And then the parent or the adult, the teacher will do, I see a yellow duck looking at me. The next page, yellow duck, yellow duck, what do you see? And so on. Kasi na, ayan, miskay sabihin natin, minsan nagbe-memorize, but it still helps them become fluent readers when they engage in uh, supportive reading or assisted reading. Another form of assisted reading is choral reading. And choral reading is reading in unison, so everybody is reading the same text together. So maybe if you're in a family, the same kids, a group of, I mean, the siblings, a group of siblings, cousins can read the same passage together. And this is helpful because it provides support to less skilled readers. It builds confidence. So pinagsasama mo yung mga magaling magbasa at hindi magaling magbasa at naririnig ng mga hindi magaling magbasa yung tamang pagbasa ng mga salita. Ah, ganun pala yun. So with an assisted reading, you are able to do something which you may not be able to do when a child reads silently. So the goal kasi is independent. So student will be able to take a more active role in reading. So now that you have paved the way for your students to read fluently and independently, you can now go to the third strategy, which is to provide plenty of practice. So the third is provide plenty of practice opportunities. So I think we have heard the same um, practice makes perfect. Yeah, meron na yung mga athletes. Uh, we usually associate this with athletes. You like, let's say, basketball players. Uh, ilan hundreds raw yung pinapractice nila ng mga foul shots and three-point shots. And then pag crunch time talagang madali na lang sa kanila, di ba? So, but meron na yung isang kasabihan na practice makes permanent. So there is a reason why we need to teach reading fluency to our students. Aside from increasing uh, comprehension, if we do not recognize their errors when they read, let's say, um, especially young kids, there are a lot of reading errors that happen when they read. Sometimes when they start reading, naman sobrang bilis, they disregard punctuation. They read without expression. So these practices may become permanent if we don't inform them, if we don't train them well. So we need to work on this. We have to give them proper feedback when we teach fluency because oral reading and practice allows you to assess their word recognition and fluency. And as we provide them with practice, uh, we have what we also call white practice and deep practice. Wide practice is you ask a child to read, and once he reads it, he'll read another story and another and another. However, there are some children who may not be reading correctly. Nasa, baka nasa, uh, uh, masyadong challenging yung binabasa nila. So, kailangan ulit-ulitin. They have to keep on reading the same passage, maybe three times, four times. Pwede na, five max na yun, ano? But they have to read it over and over again to develop fluency. And this is what we call repeated reading. Repeated reading is the practice of reading the same text over and over to develop 
uh, fluency. And students have shown, according to studies, an improvement in word recognition, accuracy, automaticity, expression, and comprehension. And they say that this is carried over to the next new passage. Maski yung susunod na babasahin nila na hindi pa nila nabasa noon, um, meron raw uh, improvement. So I'll just give two examples of how to engage in repeated reading. One is reader's theater and the other is prosody practice. Why reader's theater? Because it's fun, it's engaging, it's authentic. Meron kang audience. Um, also because reader's theater, usually yung passages, may um, madaming dahilan for reading with expression. Pwede silang maarte sa pagbabasa. Okay? Um, isa pa may audience, diba? When you read, uh, when you engage in reader's theater, there's an audience. So it's, as they say, authentic. And also, it's um, for everyone, it's both for struggling and fluent readers. Everyone can engage in it. And this is how we sometimes do it online. So the script is on screen and we do it with color codes so that the student will know what character he's reading. And then uh, sometimes we have costumes by uh, Zoom filter, like what I have here. Uh, sometimes I join, kasi kulang ng character. So I join, so I'm one of the pigs here. And then if you will notice, there are uh, there's a picture of grandparents and they are on screen because maybe grandparents can join since now we have been meeting a lot of relatives online. They could join along or they could serve as an audience. And so now, how else can we practice repeated reading? Maybe siblings can read to each other, classmates can read to each other, maybe a child can read to his pet. And now we go to um, um, prosody practice. As we mentioned a while ago, fluency is not only reading for speed, reading with expression is just as important. So we need to practice prosody too. And studies have shown that students who read orally with good expression are more likely to comprehend deeply when reading silently. So how do we engage in prosody practice? I will just um, focus on three, wordless, using wordless picture books, letter naming, and reading with emotions. So when we do um, reading with wordless picture books, you read aloud to them. Of course, ikaw na gagawa ng words kasi wordless siya. You demonstrate how to create story using illustrations and your expressive voice. And then after your first reading, have your students or your children read a page or two and notice that they too have modeled their expression after yours. So there's really a lot of room for expressive reading using wordless picture books. Another way is to practice prosody is through letter naming. So if your students are learning the alphabet but cannot exactly read yet, you can engage them in prosody practice. How? So siguro, medyo na madali lang naman siguro ituro yung punctuation marks na period, question mark, and exclamation point. So show them uh, letters and they, then you say A. A? A. Okay. And then you can also do a series of letters. A, B, C. A, B, C. A, B, C. So yun, marami tayong pwede nga uh, paraan sa pagturo ng prosody. Maski letters lang muna. And then another way is to practice um, emotions. So for example, just a short sentence or a phrase like let's eat and I am hungry. Ask them, how will you say, how will you read it when you're happy? Let's eat or excited. How are, will you read it when you're sad or angry? Diba? Let's eat. I am hungry. Gutom na ako. Diba? Iba-iba yan. Diba yung pagkakain kayo sa labas. Excited. I'm hungry. Come on, let's eat. Meron naman galit. Gutom na gutom na ako. I am hungry. Let's eat. Yan. Then so excited pag may party. Yeah. So as we help our kids, um, feedback, as we mentioned, is very, very important. So you can evaluate their oral readings. And so now, finally, we are going to the fourth strategy, which is encourage fluency through phrasing. So we have been good models, we have scaffolded, 
and you have uh, encouraged your students and children to practice. And so now we have to encourage them to engage in proper phrasing. Why? Okay, phrasing is important for comprehension and fluency, fluent readers read in meaningful phrases. Uh, just an example about comma. Siguro alam nyo na to. Let's say, um, sorry, I just have to add also that it helps less fluent readers move away from word-per-word -word reading when you teach them how to read in chunks or phrases. Hindi na word-per-word -word na parang hirap na hirap. Okay? So I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with um, uh, using um, commas. So let's say if we don't have commas, if we don't read by observing proper phrasing, we have sentence like, we are going to learn to cut and paste kids. But if we proper phrasing and with the use of comma, we can say it appropriately as, we are going to learn to cut and paste kids. May kasabihan nga na commas can kill, diba? And so how can you do this? Um, uh, the word is the basic unit of meaning in a text. However, there's more meaning when these words come in phrases. Meaning lies in phrases. So being able to chunk a text into phrases aids in comprehension. It, um, those who read in a word-per-word -word manner aren't considered fluent readers. So when reading passages, so we could put slash marks between chunks or meaningful phrases. So paying attention to these phrases while reading will, uh, will enhance fluency and comprehension. So we could practice this also on the sentence level. So there, um, since we're doing this um, online, so better to highlight the phrases. So one day last week, my sister and I drove to the lake and so on. And then sightword instruction is important. We have, I'm very sure that we all do the flashcards, sight words, and they have to read one second per word, right? So a good activity to accompany is to present the sight words in phrases and sentences. So the individual words like the, he, she, it, will make more sense if there's meaning attached to it. And so you attach other words beside it. So for example, we have, she said that. She said that. Although we do that, we really do the sight word meaning as a word, I mean, word per word. But as a next step, it's nice to introduce these sight words in phrases. And so next, let's read sight words phrases. We go out, look at him. I will walk outside. There. So those are the some strategies for um, um, reading with phrasing, observing proper phrasing. And so now we go to text selection. So what text exactly can we use to help our students become fluent readers? So for read aloud, um, our primary goal is for them to develop the love for reading. So use your favorite books, use their favorite books. What are their interests? And highly recommended also are um, award winners like Caldecott for the illustration, Newberry for the content, and try um, reading to them books that are beyond their comfort zone. Hindi lang parate yung favorite nilang fairy tales. Maybe iba-iba naman. And you can go beyond books like um, magazines, newsletters, maybe newspapers. Okay. And for providing oral support, it would be nice to provide them, um, expose them to short texts and passages Poems, kasi. and because you can also read them um, with expressions, songs, lyrics, refrains, lots of rhymes, big books, and um, just make them, just provide them with longer and more complex texts as they become more proficient in reading. And for text selection, it's important also to have a good voice and phrasing, meant to be read um, passages or books that are meant to be read orally and with expression. So these are poems scripts and narratives and for practice reading we have high frequency words phrases and short sentences from the dodge type words list so google fries dodge word lists and then google phrases and the list of phrases will come out for readers that are scripts we have some free scripts available from these sites sometimes i get from teachers paid teachers because my kids are very young and some of the the scripts here are major upper grades. So I like scripts that are really that that 
kindergarten students and grade one students can read fluently. And then for the phrase queue generator, um, there is also a website where hindi na ikaw yung mag chunk meron na ilagay mo lang. I mean, you have to type it. Okay. And then, Viola, lalabas na yung phrasing. Ayan, meron na phrasing. And so, again, what is the significance of um, teaching our kids read fluency? Definitely, the end goal of fluency is comprehension, right? Because fluency is a bridge between word recognition and comprehension. But what if, and it opens the door for comprehension, but what happens when students get stuck in the middle of the bridge? What happens when the door is closed? You will have students who are children who are a little frustrated, who don't like reading. But what we actually want for kids is to enjoy reading there and to develop their comprehension and to have access to the meaning of text. And these are my primary references for uh, this talk. And I just want to say thank you. And um, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I think I shall, uh, sorry, I shall now stop sharing <laughs> and give the floor back to Ms. Lyra. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Ms. CJ. So it is actually now time for our question and um, answer portion of our talk. So I'm going to add Ms. Rina also to the spotlight. So now there are three of us right here. Um, just a reminder to all the participants, um, we'd like you to stay after the closing remarks so that we can have a Q&A session. Uh, uh, so, sorry, so we can have a photo session with everyone. Okay, so um, we will be stopping the streaming after the closing remarks and then oh, the photo session will take place after that for everyone's um, privacy and security, okay? So it won't be live streamed on, on YouTube. Okay, so thank you so much, Ms. Rina and Ms. CJ for um, your talks. Um, we've... I've been reading through the chat and um, the, the comments are very positive. And there are a few questions that were raised. And um, some of the, the questions that, that, that I'm going to ask you first are questions that were sent ahead of time during the registration. So this one is for Ms. Rina, but Ms. CJ, please feel free to add if um, you can also answer. Uh, the question is, when should phonological awareness be taught? How frequent? And um, one question came up is, up to what grade should we teach phonological awareness? Okay, yes. Actually, the, you know, the, they say, the research that I saw is like phonemic awareness is can already be taught in kindergarten or even as early as pre-kindergarten, right? And it says, and I'm guessing it's because they refer to like, they refer to like, when should it be taught like formally? And, and, and that's not, one research would say like not more than 10 minutes, but the, actually the national reading panel would say at least 15 minutes. So um, I would say 10 to 15 minutes, but it, also, of course, depends, Lyra, like when should we begin teaching? That's the prescribed, no? But then again, if you have, let's say, an adult struggling reader who was only diagnosed very, very later on and, you know, has a deficit, phonemic awareness, or awareness of her beginning, middle, or final sound, of course, gagawin rin natin yun. So parang in a sense, Kung assuming uh, walang problema, then di ba, kindergarten, but also doesn't mean that you're not going to expose them to rhyme habang, you know, three years old or two years old, di ba? Mm -hmm. But yun yun. And then also, um, yun yung, yung frequency. I would say 10 to 15 minutes. They say also um, uh, 15 minutes a day for a semester in kindergarten, anywhere from 14 to 18 hours. But these are just guidelines because I think... Um, 
yun na nga eh, because iba-iba rin naman talaga yung mga tao at saka yung needs nila. So, but as a guy, these are just guidelines. Some kids just pick it up naturally. Some kids need more direct and explicit instruction. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, maybe it will also be good to point out that since we are in the Philippine setting, uh, even uh, English language learners benefit from phonological awareness instruction. So regardless of the age, um, if they are beginning readers in English, even if they are older, then it wouldn't hurt, right? It wouldn't hurt siguro to, to have phonological awareness instruction. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Rina. So Ms. CJ, uh, you, you, shared, you already shared e-resources, so thank you so much for that. Um, so my question for you is, how do we engage students to read more and to read fluently in an online setup? Because um, we all know, like the teachers who are here right now, we know how different it is when we have our face-to-face -face classes and, and you know, face-to-face -face interaction with our students compared to just seeing them on the computer screen. So like, how can, what can we do? to get them, um, to make them engaged in our reading classes? I guess similar to what, um, how we do things to encourage them to become fluent readers, reading aloud is very important. So I was reading, I saw one of the questions on the chat, on the chat box. So how do you read aloud uh, during an online class? I forgot to mention a while ago. I usually say it, but thank you for asking. I have been using YouTube because we are in a we used to teach um, face to face and we have a lot of storybooks as you can see in Sir Lyra's background. And dali dali lang namin. Pero nasan ba kami ngayon? Nasan ba kami? Nasa bahay. Nasan ang libro? Wala sa amin. So, and we cannot also I will spark. Madami. So, uh, I have been using YouTube. You will just be surprised at the number of stories available on YouTube. Just type a title. And it's usually there. But what's important is you choose. Madaming nagbabasa. Make sure maganda yung accent, maganda yung speed, yung rate. Uh, with express. Pipiliin mo pa rin. And then yung iba masyadong mahina, mabagong, masyadong mabagal. And kasi yung iba-iba, ibang nationalities yung nagbabasa. So iba-iba rin yung accent. So, so for reading aloud, um, a source for online instruction is, for me, at least personally speaking, I use um, YouTube. And then if you want to, your own students to engage in or um, uh, shared reading, then mute the volume afterwards. So, or collaborative reading, mute the volume. Another question I saw was, how do you, in, um, can you still do read alouds for eight to nine years? Maski 13, 14, maski ilan taon pwede. And maybe since kunwari high school, na sobrang tanda, pwede naman ng ano. Kasi syempre, pag high school, it's your liar knows this, na tutu siya <laughs> ng high school. <laughs> <laughs> Hindi naman na siguro story books, di ba? Chapter books na. And so, Mr. Lyra, right? You do chapter books read aloud. Yes, and, yes, yeah. I do. Uh -oh. And collaborative. Uh, I think collaborative also. Collaborative oh. sometimes. In, or... in my, collaborative, sorry, to clarify, that's alternate. After yeah. night reading, yeah. yeah. So, so, so they we take, take turns. turns reading, yeah. So if I may share, so um, I'm working also with a group of high school students who are volunteers, um, and they read aloud to rescued street children through an organization oh, called um, Visions of Hope, and we have um, we do alternate reading with them, and uh, it helps with their fluency. And it also helps, I guess it's a no, it's a mutual ano naman. It's the the benefits are mutual because the our volunteers get to practice their Filipino and then the the, the children also get to practice reading in in English. So uh, read alouds can be beneficial to any age. Um, especially for those who are struggling readers. So if you do read alouds, it lessens the I guess the stress on them or the anxiety that they have to read on their own. So, yeah, read aloud and collaborative reading. So, Ms. CJ, this is another question for May you. May I add also repeated reading. Very important to develop fluency, <laughs> repeated reading. 
Yes. Um, may I also uh, ask you the question? Because there's um, there was a question that was sent. Um, do you recommend reading ebooks? Yes, especially during online classes. That's what we have been using. Ebooks. Ang hirap, di ba? Mahirap talaga. Kasi ayoko naman mag-scan kasi parang feeling ko bawal. So, kung meron nag-scan na iba sa internet, siya na lang yung ginagamit ko. <laughs> But there are some legal sites like Internet Archive. Kasi I think, Teacher Lyra, di ba there's this law na pag yung book ay mga 1960s yata na yes, published, uh, pag, uh, pwede na siya public to the public. Domain. When it's in the public domain, yes, you can share. Or um, if pareho ka, if you and the student both have subscriptions, why not? Diba? You yeah. can you can use just uh do we do we uh treat the ebook just like a regular book? Like do we do our before reading yes. questions or during reading and after reading yes. questions? And and because of okay. Zoom, they can also do the the feature highlight, underline. Mm-hmm. They can I can still write notes, they can still like mm-hmm. when we answer questions the very deep detail questions uh, can you look for it pinapa-highlight ko pa rin Mm-mm. and also kasi maka- may, kasi sobrang classic minsan mm-hmm. yung nasa internet archive but you can still find um, books by Roald Dahl yung mga Frog and Toads nakakachamba ka rin naman ng mga very good books and then yeah mm-hmm. as you said subscription sometimes it's free books script epic I was able to subscribe last year to books for free because of the pandemic but I don't know now if it's <laughs> for free Nakachamba. Last year, Uh-oh. basta lahat ng libre, avail. Go, go, go. And then I think they cut it like a deadline. Uh-uh. And yeah. then, um, like, when is, um, so it's, a, there's, uh, when is, a, when is it, a, when should you ask questions during reading? Kasi di ba before reading, we ask questions para to help to unlock vocabulary. We ask questions to uh, motivate them, to give them information about Uh, what's the book what the book is about but during reading when do we ask when do we ask questions ako madalas um if it's like um i teach young kids so most of the time may pattern yung stories there's a problem there's a solution so i just make it clear at the beginning so i stop it okay what is his problem it seems pj or bunny has a problem what's his problem and why And then I just set, I, I just make sure that they know the problem so they will know the how how the problem is being solved. So yung mga ganon. And then what is she doing? Is this working? Hindi, hindi parate every page, ha? <laughs> Kasi so ayaw rin nila yun, eh. Yeah, nakakapagod. So it's for, <laughs> for the read. story elements, right? For Let's me, see, for the young kids, for yes. Young kids, sure. okay? Like, and after... Then, exposition, you ask about the characters yes. and the problem, solution. Okay. Lalo right. na rin pag may inferential questions na hindi nila makukuha. But you know, just have to make sure that the details are accurate before they can make inferences. Okay. So, um, here is uh, a difficult um, but oh, wait, wait lang. So, there are many questions here about about Wala comprehension. Uh, Ms. Vina, is it possible to to tweak some of the phonological awareness activities that you mentioned? Like, instead of onset rhyme, can you, um, let's say, instead of b at, can you teach bat to in blending? Okay, you know what? Because some kids have a harder time, di ba, Siege? Sometimes talagang kahirap sila sa odd set rhyme. Parang mas iba, mas kaya nila yung ba at. Oo. Yeah. Ay, oo, oo. Tama, tama, tama. Diba? Tama, tama, tama. We do it. Parang inaka-touch mo. No? Oo. Yung uli na sa huli. Diba? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Sige. So, great. What works best, no? <laughs> what works best. Yeah, what works best. And then, um, for... Like, um, there was a question here about uh, Filipino and English, like how, I guess, like how to teach or or what kind of phonological awareness activities or phonemic awareness activities that parents can do for um, bilingual students, like for, for children who are learning both Filipino and English. I think it's still awareness for the language, diba? I mean... Actually, mas madali nga, I think, mag-phonological awareness sa Filipino kasi talagang yung 
ortho yung orthography or the art that the language is is transparent i meaning parang may one to one uh correspondence yeah by letter to sound pero sa english kunyari shoe there's just two phonemes diba there are two sounds sh u but there are actually four letters in shoe although you just hear two sounds mm -hmm. right but um either way because you're not really you can use english you can use uh english words or filipino words i think because it's just really all about the individual sound right mm -hmm. uh -oh. so um but i think uh oh ganun siguro or else siguro dahil di ba sila medyo pusa di ba ganun medyo multisyllabic tayo bakit mm -hmm. ang filipino for multisyllabic multisyllabic uh -oh. yeah then stop very easily to multisyllabic words and i guess um you can start with a very basic like the nursery <laughs> rhymes uh -oh. uh -oh, to help them familiarize with the sounds like uh now that i'm a reading teacher i can appreciate the song apples and bananas because so, it changes the vowel sounds. I, I like to eat apples and binini, something like that. Yeah, they okay. change the vowel sounds. Or maybe um, in Filipino, mga tong tong tong, pakitong kitong. <laughs> so, something like that. So, yeah. Okay. And um, how long is the recommended reading session for online classes? I would say depending on the age, right? For the younger kids, maybe 30, 45 minutes. All the older kids, an hour max. But um, I, that's a question that just came up right now. That's just based on my experience. Because for the younger kids, if we go past 30, it's too much. It's too much for them. Okay, and this is the difficult question that is very timely. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Mr. Eric, if you are still here, we would like to request your assistance in answering this question. So um, the question is, how can we provide effective literacy programs for our students in modular learning? Because as we are all aware, in the Philippines, um, our infrastructure for internet connection is not that great. And um, in the rural areas, um, they really depend on modular learning. So... Um, what is one way that the teachers can um, provide effective literacy programs for students who have to learn via modules instead of synchronous online instruction through Zoom or Google Meet? Mm. Mr. Eric is quiet, so I think he's not here anymore. <laughs> okay, so... Um, I oh, guess I'm here, I'm here. Uh, yes, you're here. Yay, easy, thank easy. you. Uh uh, but um I took note of what he said earlier, but hey, I think I it's can also answer that if you want. No, I'd let you answer it, please. But I think what we uh, what the teachers should ensure in their modules is that the materials are at the grade level. I yeah. guess uh, I'll make sure it's appropriate and then I will add you to the spotlight, sir, because um, I think as the RAP president, you have um, you have more um, experience and more answers to, to this question. It's like, how can we gather authentic data that will um, assess the reading level of students who are learning through modules? Uh, in my experience uh, in school, I cannot answer that. But because of I'm a, I'm a RAP president, I'm, <laughs> I'm going around in Zoom or other means. I have seen that many students in the modular approach are actually playing in the playground or in near the banana plantations uh, or, neighbor, or their neighborhood, <laughs> right? After doing the modules. So... Uh, with my dialogue with other uh, education supervisors, they suggest that teachers conduct mod uh, visits, no home visits, to or or if not possible, uh, community visits in the barangays and LGUs, and assign community tutors who may be uh, out of school youth, or even teachers or parent volunteers. 
I have oh, yes. started a project with the Office of the Vice President, and this is one project we want to pursue, but this project is only done in their learning hubs. So if you request the Reading Association of the Philippines, uh, we can probably provide training for parents and learning guardians to help their children, not only in developing decoding and comprehension or other aspects of reading and even fluency. So we can organize parents orientation you know, in order to help them because it's truly, it's really different and it's really hard to assess uh, data on reading through the modular approach because reading necessitates social interaction. And with our students in the private institutions in, involved in Google Meet and Zoom, we can actually meet them in, during consultation period, engagement block or special, uh, specialist block to, to help them. We can listen to them, you know, we can determine, but the modular approach is really very challenging. And it requires for public school teachers, especially to do home visits. We have uh, public school teachers who are watching us right now, and I think that is their practice. Uh, they do home visits and check and give them word lists to practice also. Thank you. I hope Thank I have answered the question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I agree with your, um, with your point. Um, it's, I know how difficult it is because the IATF changes guidelines every so often, right? So it's not easy for teachers to go out and uh, maybe meet with the parents. But hopefully, um, the, the situation will get better soon and um, we will find more ways to um, connect with the parents. I think uh, my takeaway from from Mr. Eric's um, answer is that it's important also to have a strong um, relationship with the parent, right? Because the parents are the primary primary teachers in the module learning. So um, if we as teachers can help um, the parents, can train the parents bec and become train the parents in becoming learning guardians, then um, that's, I guess, the only way we can um, make sure that the children who are learning via modules will succeed. Okay, so it is 11 o'clock. So um, I would, um, okay, so I, uh, Thank you for your questions. I will save this chat. And if there are any questions that we haven't answered, uh, we will try our best to answer. And um, I would then like to call on, um, is Ms. Laxmi or Ms. Laxmi Maluya, happy president for the closing remarks. And then please, everybody, please stay after the closing remarks for our class photo. <laughs> Ayos na ng buhok. <laughs> okay. Okay, Miss Laxmi. Is my audio clear? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, I will remove the spotlight on myself. Okay, hi Miss Laxmi. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me, Miss Jolie. And thank you everyone for, uh, thank you Miss Rina and Miss CJ for that wonderful talk. Uh, na refresh yung aking uh, uh, teaching reading skills and also reminded me of all the reading times that I have been teaching. Uh, good morning parents, educators, and teachers. For me, um, I'm a homeschool parent, no? So, talagang hands-on ako pagdating sa mga, sa pagda pagdating sa teaching the kids. And I'm so happy that um, to, to hear and be reminded of all the re reading techniques and reading interventions. Because for us, reading is really important part because through reading, 
you enter different worlds. You know, even if you're alone and if, if you know how to read, you can enter any world that you can uh, read about. So reading is really important. And for us, medyo OA siguro ako, if I may share. <laughs> Kasi I, I love reading also. So when I was pregnant, I read this book and it says that it is good to read while you are pregnant to start <laughs> reading to your baby. <laughs> so that's what I did. So baby pa lang, nasa chan pa lang ng anak ko, I've been reading to them. So that's how, how that's how important for me is reading. <laughs> so yon. And uh, as a teacher, um, uh, it's important to really know uh, when when to intervene, yeah, and into and also to um, learn different techniques so that your your learner will, uh, you know be able to read and also get to be uh, a reader. And yun nga, no, dito sa Pilipinas, medyo sad part na medyo late tayo pagdating sa intervention. I'm so happy that reading specialist is doing this and uh, educating as many parents, as many edu- uh, teachers as possible because importante talaga yung reading. And uh, I want to uh, go back to what Miss CJ, uh, yeah, CJ's shared, um, and Miss Rina's shared. No, may babalikan lang ako don because um, na kwento ni Miss CJ that uh, important part is also to be model, to be a model. No, as parents uh, in the homeschool community, when we educate parents about teaching their children, ito yung lagi nilang na encounter is that they don't know how to teach. So it's especially reading, especially in those aspects. And in my experience, as a teacher and a homeschool parent, simply lang minsan ang, ano, ang sagot eh. You have to show them the importance of reading. And that's why in our, also in our practice, in our family, we do read alouds as early as possible and read the stories my husband, until now, he reads stories to my children and they are all like teens and adults already because that's how we connect and bond, through reading. And uh, yung exposure natin sa mga anak natin in uh, the importance of reading, andun yun eh, yung papakita natin sa kanila that we are readers also. So, and also with the 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 modeling no it's 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 for us to re, to show them yung mga bata na, na, na nabanggit ni sir ni sir uh, Freddy kanina na social interaction when it comes to reading kasi nga naman like ni CJ said no we cannot be readers if we don't hear the words uh, at one time i encountered this student who has not read and has not spoken and when i and when I interviewed the parent, it's because nobody talks to the child. So as parents, uh, the first thing that we can do really with our children who is learning to read is to also talk to them as much as possible. Sobrang okay na nga talaga nung reading is really a very fun uh, part of teaching in my, especially with my children, and all talaga yun yung pinaka fun because I was able to label all the parts of my house, <laughs> parts of our house, yung mga door, kasi di ba sight words, you label the everything that you can label. Para ando na kagad yung uh, nabanggit nga ni, ano, di ba, oh, I forgot who mentioned si Miss Rina po, Rina ba, or Miss CJ. That when you read even uh, difficult words, but you you show them those words at an early age, palang they encounter those those words. When they read, it becomes easy for them to identify it. So that's what I what I did. Um, I lab, I labeled our house with all the labels that I uh, the words that I wanted them to to learn. Mm-hmm. And since 
we wanted them to learn three languages at the same time, three labels yon. <laughs> Ang hirap sa atin sa, sa Pilipinas because I want to teach patriotism also to my kids and I don't want them to just be Inglesera at Inglesero. So, you know, I taught them three languages at the same time. I don't know if the if it's the correct one, but that's what I did. <laughs> Please correct me. Na lang. <laughs> that's, a, that's how I did it because I want them to be familiarized with Bisaya because my husband is Bisaya and then Tagalog, uh, Philippine words and English words. That's how I labeled everything. So anyway, I don't want to take so much of your time. I'm just so excited. Naka, sabi sa akin, mag-yellow ako. So, <laughs> napaka, napahalungkat ako ng yellow. I don't wear yellow. <laughs> Actually, this is my daughter's clothes. <laughs> and I'm uh, I'm just so happy na medyo nag-jive because uh, yun nga, reading is a fun activity that's, that because of the difficulty that many students encounter, no? Uh, it's It becomes sad for me to see high schoolers who are not readers. Talagang nakakahinayang na umaangat yung yung grade level nila without them being good readers and uh, and in early intervention is really important kaya nga sana no I, I i do hope that we can educate as many parents and help teachers to to make their make the parents up uh a co teaching partner or something so that they, it, is, it is easier kasi talaga in the homeschooling community it's easier for the children to be taught by a teacher because of the collaborative effort between teacher and the parent meron follow up kagad may follow up sa bahay may follow up yung, yung lessons I think that's it <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, um, Miss Laxmi, for joining us today. So before, um, okay, I'm before I end this the stream. I just wanted to share with everyone the services that um, we offer. So we have online reading programs for um, small group and one-on-one -on -one intervention, and. Um, under learning specialists, actually, they should be under learning specialists or at your sister center. We have virtual book clubs. So if you just like your, your children to join a group of their peers and read books, this is um, a good way for, for them to connect with other children, especially now na they're not allowed to go outside. So we have an English book club and a Filipino book club. And we also offer academic and academic support and homework desk services in Filipino, math, and Araling Panipunan. So um, I will stop sharing now and I will also stop the live stream. Thank you for those who are watching on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, in behalf of our speakers, we would like to thank um, everyone, parents and educators who joined us today for learning with us and hopefully um, together that we learn to advocate for our children and our students and help empower them through literacy.